We submit work to the GPU through a command queue. A command queue is an interface that accepts command lists and executes the commands on the GPU. A command list is used to record the work that we would like to be done on the GPU in the form of commands. Recording commands happens on the CPU. A command allocator provides and manages the memory that's required to store those commands. The simplest form of submitting work is to first record the commands on the CPU and then execute them on the GPU. To ensure that both CPU and GPU take turns recording and executing commands, we need to synchronize work submission. This is done by using signaling fences and events. I'll explain this synchronization later in more detail. Evidently, this method requires the GPU to wait for the CPU when recording commands and, conversely, the CPU must wait for the GPU while it's executing commands. A more efficient scheme is using multiple command allocators to record commands for multiple frames. Each allocator, along with the data needed for each frame, is referred to as a frame buffer. In frame buffer approach, the CPU continuously keeps recording commands, while the GPU executes the commands as fast as possible. Ideally, the workload for the CPU and GPU is balanced, which ensures that both components can continue without stalling. Realistically though, often either CPU or the GPU has to wait for the other to finish work. In case that the recording on the CPU is the bottleneck, there is one more option for improvement. We can use multiple command lists to record commands in parallel using multiple threads. In this case, we need as many command lists as the number of threads, as well as the same number of command allocators per frame buffer. For the implementation of our graphics engine, I will start with three frame buffers using a single thread. In the future, when we have realistic workloads, we can make a decision on whether it's beneficial to implement a multi-threaded version. In order to synchronize CPU and GPU, we can assign a number to each frame while recording commands. We call this number a fence value because we'll use a fence to communicate this number between GPU and CPU. The fence value is monotonically increased after each frame. Whenever the GPU has finished executing commands in a frame, it will signal the fence with that frame's fence value. The signaled value is called the completed fence value. When we want to start a new frame, we can compare the fence value of that frame with the completed fence value. If the frame's fence value is less than or equal to the completed fence value, that means that the GPU has finished executing the commands and we can continue and record new commands. If the frame's fence value is greater than the completed fence value, that means that the GPU has not executed the commands in this frame yet and we need to wait. In this case, we give the fence an event object and wait for that event to be triggered when the completed fence value equals the frame's fence value. Now we are ready to implement CPU-GPU synchronization in code. Before writing the class, I'd like to explain a bit about resources, descriptors, and descriptor heaps. This is going to be a high-level and condensed explanation, so I highly recommend reading the online documentation for a deeper understanding of these subjects. While rendering a scene, we need to provide the GPU with the information needed to render the objects in the scene. We can provide this information using resources. Vertex buffers, textures, and constant buffers are a few examples of types of resources that we can use. With some exceptions that we'll discuss later, we often need to tell the GPU how a particular resource will be used. We can provide information about the purpose and format of a resource using resource descriptors. A descriptor, also referred to as a resource view, tells the hardware in what way to view the resource it's describing. As an example, consider a texture that has multiple MIP levels. We can render to this texture while viewing it as a render target. Subsequently, it can be viewed as a shader resource in a shader, which will blur and render it to the next MIP level. As you can see, the same resource may have multiple views or descriptors. A descriptor is a small block of memory with a GPU-specific opaque format. Not considering the ray tracing part of D3D12 for now, there are six types of descriptors. Render target views, depth stencil views, shader resource views, unordered access views, 
constant buffer views, and samplers. The memory in which the scripters are created is provided by the scripter heaps. It's not possible to use any other memory allocation mechanism to reserve memory for the scripters. A descriptor heap is in charge of hosting memory that can be used for descriptors. The size of each type of descriptor will vary from GPU to GPU. Therefore, we need to use a dedicated heap type for different types of descriptors. The size of shader resource views, constant buffer views, and unordered access views is always the same. So the same heap type can be used for these. Other heap types exist for render target views, depth stencil views, and samplers. Descriptor heaps can be shader visible. That means that they can be bound to the pipeline and accessed by shaders. In that case, the memory is most likely allocated on the GPU and mapped onto system memory. Otherwise, system memory is used to host the descriptors. Heaps that contain render target views and depth stencil views can't be shader visible. Similar to regular pointers when we allocate memory, we'll get a descriptor handle when we allocate a slot on the heap. This handle is basically an offset relative to the base address of the heap. Shader visible descriptors have both a CPU and a GPU handle. It's not recommended to write to the heap directly. Instead, D3D12 API provides us with functions that we can call to create and copy descriptors. We give the information about the descriptor and the descriptor handle that points to an available slot on the heap, and the function will create a descriptor at that location. Keeping track of available slots is the responsibility of the programmer, and that's the reason that we are going to write a simple descriptor heap allocator class. Now let's continue and add the source files. A free list is a relatively simple container which consists of a buffer that is formatted in slots big enough to contain an item of type T. Every time we add an item, the buffer grows to make room for more items. However, when we remove an item, instead of shrinking the buffer, the index of the removed slot is put in a member variable that I call next free index. When there are no removed slots yet, the value of next free index is an invalid ID. When more items are removed, we use the first four bytes of each slot that was previously removed to record the index of the next slot that was removed. In a way, we are creating a linked list of available slots, and each time a slot is reused, we update the value of next free index to point to the next available slot that we can use. The last available slot points to an invalid ID again, so we can determine when there are no slots left to be reused and we need to grow the buffer. Now we are ready to implement the free list. This is a traditional DirectX graphics pipeline. It consists of fixed function and programmable shader stages. The first versions of Direct3D only had fixed function stages, but pretty soon the first two programmable shader stages were introduced, the vertex and pixel shader stages. DirectX10 added the geometry shader stage, and DirectX11 added the tessellation stages and the compute shader, which I'll get to in a minute. All stages prior to the rasterizer stage are collectively referred to as the geometry stages. In order to use this pipeline, at least a vertex shader needs to be set. All other stages are optional. A vertex shader processes one vertex at a time. In general, the vertices are read from a vertex buffer by the input assembler and passed to the vertex shader. Tessellation and geometry shaders can process one primitive at a time. The most used primitive type is a triangle, but there are more types of primitives defined in D3D, like different control point patch primitives that can be used with the tessellation stages. The fixed function rasterizer takes a triangle, line or point and determines which pixels are overlapped by that primitive. Then the pixel shader is invoked for each one of those pixels. Please keep in mind that I am omitting some details here that I'll get to eventually, but right now I only want to give a course overview and not distract you with a lot of details, which are easily forgotten anyway. The final stage is the output merger, which will write the results of the rasterizer and pixel shader to the render targets and depth buffer, if any. 
In 2020, Microsoft introduced an alternative to this pipeline, which reduces the number of geometry stages and gives more flexibility for processing vertices. It also makes parallel processing of vertices more explicit, as I'll explain in a second. In this pipeline, all geometry stages have been replaced with just two stages, the mesh shader stage and the amplification shader stage, with the latter being optional. These shader stages are rather similar to the compute shader stage, which runs the shaders in groups of threads. Invoking a mesh shader in this way explicitly processes multiple vertices in parallel. The amplification shader can be used to generate or reduce primitives in a way similar to the tessellation stages and geometry shader stage. In this series, I'll start with the old pipeline with the vertex shader, and later on, I'm also going to add support for mesh shaders. Of course, there is also the direct X ray tracing feature, but that's a story for another day. Finally, we have the compute pipeline, which has just one shader stage. We will use compute shaders when we do light culling for the forward plus render path. Looking back at the first pipeline I talked about, we see that we need to define a state for it in order to use it. For example, we need to attach shader programs, vertex and index buffers, and also tell it where to render the final image to. We can define such a state using a pipeline state object. There are a lot of settings that can be configured to define a pipeline state object. In this example, we have the input layout, which describes the format of the vertices, attach the vertex shader and a pixel shader, and also we defined a rasterizer state. Using a rasterizer state, we can, for example, tell the rasterizer to output a wireframe instead of solid triangles. We can then set this pipeline state while recording commands. Together with the geometry data, render targets, and depth tensile buffer, the pipeline is almost ready to execute recorded commands. It is almost ready because in general, we need to provide shader programs with more information about the objects that we are trying to render. For example, we often need to pass the camera and objects positions and the list of shader resource views of textures. Direct3D12's mechanism for passing this data to the shaders is by using a root signature, which is a tiny buffer that is just 256 bytes in length, or 64 slots of 4 bytes each. We can put any 32-bit constant directly in such a slot. Further, we can put certain resource view types in the buffer. This will, however, take two slots. Finally, we can put a descriptor table in the buffer, which defines one or more descriptor ranges in the descriptor heap. This takes one slot of space. Each piece of information in this buffer is called a root parameter. Since we can put pretty much anything in this buffer, we need to describe how this data should be interpreted. This is done using a root signature description, which takes an array of root parameters. In today's video, I'm going to show you how we can create a root signature. The final root parameter in our example is a root descriptor table. As I mentioned, we can't put descriptors for textures directly in the root signature, so we need to use a range of descriptors in the descriptor heap. In order to do this, we need to use a root descriptor table which can point to one or more descriptor ranges of any descriptor type. 